Greetings folks, it's Professor Fiore. In today's video, we are going to take a closer look at distortion in a common emitter amplifier. Specifically, we're going to look at a way of reducing or controlling the distortion through the use of swamping. Now, we already saw a video on the effect of swamping, theoretically, but we're going to use the simulation to take a closer look. So here's a little amplifier, which was featured in another video with some slight modifications. So what we have, just to recap, is a little BJT NPN over here that's utilizing a split bipolar power supply to bias it. Um, we can use the approximation that the base for DC is just about zero volts. If we consider the size of the base and emitter resistors, so given that, if this is zero or maybe minus 0.1, something like that, we're going to lose another 7 tenths on the base emitter, which is going to leave us with maybe 9.2 or 9.3 volts of the power supply to drop across the emitter resistances, 4.6K total. So we divide the 4.6K into that 9.2, 9.3 volts. We get about 2 milliamps, so the R prime E is going to be 26 millivolts, right? That's our constant, divided by the two milliamps for 13 ohms. Now, the gain of this amplifier, RC, 5K, and parallel with our load, 10K, gives us three and a third K, 3.33K. We divide that by the swapping resistor plus our prime E, the 113, all right? Now, that is gonna give us a gain of just under 30. Right, an inverting gain of uh, just under 30. So, theoretically, as discussed before, if we were to change this swapping resistor, we should be able to not only change the gain, but we could alter the distortion. And essentially, it's a, it's a trade-off. The larger we make the swapping resistor, the lower the distortion will be, at least that's what it should be theoretically, at the cost of reducing the gain. And this should be a one-to-one -one sort of thing. In other words, if I'm willing to sacrifice the gain by a factor of two, what I'm gonna get out of that is a decrease in the distortion by a factor of two, right? If it's a, you know, a factor of 10, we can reduce the distortion by a factor of 10 by giving up the gain a factor of 10. This is for a consistent output. Now, this is an important thing to remember. You want to check your results always at the same output voltage. Let's say one volt peak or two volts peak or you know whatever the heck it is that you, you consider nominal, you have to be consistent because with an amplifier like this, the larger the output voltage is, the more distortion you're going to get. So if you just leave the input signal the same, if you never change it, High gain amplifiers are going to have bigger outputs and regardless of anything else, they're going to be expected to have more distortion. Remember the transfer characteristic of this transistor is this exponential, you know, inverse sort of log kind of curve. And as the signal swings back and forth, it's not going across a straight line, it's going across this curve. And that is impressed on the uh, Ultimately, the load voltage, right, as this current changes, ultimately the load voltage changes similarly. So if I keep the signal change small, there's not going to be a lot of distortion. The bigger the signal change is, the more of that curve we see and the worse the distortion is. So we have to keep V load consistent. In this simulation, I'm going to set this up so that the, uh, the load voltage is approximately one volt peak. Just It's a nice convenient number. There's nothing magic about it. But, you know, easy to remember, okay? All right, so um, with that gain of a little under 30, it turns out we would need an input signal of about 36 millivolts to get this one volt on the output, okay? So let's just verify that this is doing, you know, what we expect. We'll come up with a, a transient anal analysis. And see what we have over here. Okay, so we can see the maroon here is V load. 
And as I said, we were expecting about a volt peak and that's what we're getting. We see the inversion, nice big signal. Everything's looking good. All right. Now there is a, uh, a lab experiment, right? In the, in the free OER um, lab manual that, that accompanies the text that looks at this. It does require that you have a high quality signal source and distortion analyzer to effectively measure the effect, the, these effects. So if you don't, right, if you don't have a, um, a nice distortion analyzer, and you know, unfortunately some labs don't, you know, it is a little bit more of a specialized piece of equipment, nothing wrong with that. Um, we can at least do it through this uh, simulator, right? How do we do it in the simulator? Well, it depends on your simulator. Some simulators literally have a distortion analyzer tool. In, um, in Tina TI, what you can do is uh, something called Fourier analysis, right? So Fourier series basically calculates, it sort of, it, it takes apart, if you will, the output signal and turns it into its frequency components, all of the harmonics, all the multiples of this and then adds them up and compares them to the total signal. And we just uh, represent that as a percentage. The bigger the percentage value is, the worse the distortion is, right? So, you know, a, a 2% THD, 2% total harmonic distortion, basically says of the output signal, 2% of it is these extra harmonics that are created through the non-ideal characteristic of the transistor. All right, so um, we're gonna set this up Base frequency is one kilohertz, and we're just gonna do 16 harmonics, which would be plenty. That puts us pretty much near the, the uh, upper limit of, of uh, frequency response for most humans. So we'll just calculate this, boom. And this will tell you the various um, distortion pieces that you get out of here, right, for each individual piece. But I'm really con uh, concerned more, more than anything with the total at the bottom. Right? And this is coming up at just about 0.4%, right? It's 0.39511. Let's just call it 0.4%, all right? Beautiful. Now, we go in and we change the gain on this thing by changing the swapping resistor. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna throw in, instead of uh, 100 ohms, we're gonna go by a factor of about three. So I'm gonna put in a 320 ohm. Now, you got 320 plus the 13 for the R prime E. That gives you 333 ohms. You got a 3.33K out here. That's going to give you a gain of 10. All right. I'm going to have to compensate on my input signal. I don't want 36 millivolts anymore. Because um, again, I still want that one volt output. So with a gain of 10, I'm going to need about 100 millivolts coming in. All right. So let's get rid of that 36 mils. Put in 100 millivolts. All right, so we're basically sacrificing gain by a factor of about three, not quite three. All right, which means the distortion should change by a factor of not quite three. Now, let's go up and uh, just just to verify, we'll do a transient analysis. And sure enough, okay, there we are. We're you know, just about one volt again. It's slightly off, but close enough, as we like to say. We can see the input signal's a lot bigger. You know, it's the, it's the same colors as last time, right? So there's our bigger input signal, still out of phase. Everything looks really good. Now let's go take a look at the distortion. Okay, back to the Fourier analysis. Bloop. Calculate. Hey, look at this. 0.14678. Right, so virtually 0.15, not quite a factor of three, just like the gain, not quite a factor of three. It works out really well. And we can sit here and sort of play games with this, little what if kinds of things, increase this a little bit more, and guess what? Less gain, less distortion. Generally, it's gonna keep that same ratio. You know, if we went from the original 100 to 500 ohms, you know, we're gonna change the gain by a factor of about five, then that distortion should go down by a similar factor, right? A factor of about five. Okay, so it's very effective, this idea. You can control your distortion, you control the gain. 
Now, you might be thinking, some people always ask this question, well, geez, I'm giving up the gain, um, and I'm giving up, granted, the distortion. I don't want the distortion, so that's a good thing to give up, right? But I'm not getting the gain. So doesn't it work out to be a wash? In other words, I'm going to need another amplifier to get the signal back up to where it would have been, right? I mean, you have a certain input, you know, like a microphone, let's say. So I need a certain amount of gain. All right, so I sacrificed the gain of a factor of three roughly here. Don't I need another amplifier stage with a gain of three so that my output signal is the same size as what it would have been with this, you know, microphone, let's say. Well, yeah, you would need another stage, but that other stage is not going to have a particularly high distortion. In this case, you only need a gain of three. As a matter of fact, you'd probably split that gain up a little bit more evenly than what we would have here. But the bottom line is that the distortion of the two pieces together is going to be less than the distortion of the one by itself. It is more expensive because you have a lot more components. All right. You know, it's physically larger. There are, you know, more considerations in that regard. But you're buying performance in this case. You're getting an amplifier that has lower distortion. There are other things that we can do to lower distortion. This is one of them. It's sort of the frontline thing that we want to do. Make sure you have enough swamping in there because we don't want to rely solely on that R prime E because it's dynamic. It changes a lot as the input signal changes. And when we start talking power amplifiers with big output signal swings, that can produce tons of distortion. Okay, more on this in future videos. See you then. Take care.